and welcome to Begin Japanology. I'm Peter Barakan. This month we present another of our series of portraits of Japanophiles. And our guest on the program today is an Englishman called Adam Booth, who's an artist working in the style called Nihonga or Japanese painting. Adam, hello. Oh, Peter. Nice hey, to thanks meet for you. Come, thanks for coming. Welcome to my studio. Or I was expecting a, something a bit more traditional somehow. This is definitely not that. This is um, one of my earlier paintings. Well, I was painting the traditional way, but I wanted to make something new, and uh, I wanted to put something of myself into it. Hmm. And uh, I decided that to make a contrast with this kind of traditional Japanese crane, hmm. that I'd use a, a light bulb. Hmm. And uh, light bulbs are kind of special for me. I think that they're just a perfect symbol of uh, technology and uh, it's that once mankind developed the light bulb, they were able to control light. For me, it's like the uh, fire from Pr Prometheus. Mm -hmm. Once we could control light, we could do everything. So culture, I industry, everything was made possible because we got light. So. Okay. Uh, I've got another work here, if you'd like to have Oh, look. sure. Um, this is, uh, again, it's a, like the, the contrast. Mm. of uh, kind of modern culture, modern technology, mm. with the, the general feeling of the picture is still very much a Japanese painting. Uh -huh. And again, my favorite light bulbs. Yeah, and this painting, growing on a plant. Yep, yeah, they're coming to life. Uh -huh. And uh, here we have a computer keyboard. Oh, you've got, like, newspaper. Uh, oh. It's, uh, the newspaper is stuck on the, on the back. Because it's a, the keyboard, it's a contemporary thing, oh. I wanted to use a different material instead of the traditional material. So oh. I used uh, just something we have around every day, and I decided to use a newspaper and collage it onto the back. Well, it's the, the contrast of the contemporary technology, these computer keyboards with the more traditional flowers and the, the general feel of, of the Japanese painting. Mm -hmm. Very Japanese, I would say. Adam Booth was born in Worcester, England in 1973. Encouraged by his parents, he became fond of painting at a young age. At university, he studied contemporary art and created a series of works with a scientific theme. In this piece, a bee is connected to the filament in an electric light bulb. It fancifully suggests that when the electricity is turned on, the dead bee will come back to life. Booth first encountered Nihonga painting in 1998, when an exhibition was held at the British Museum. Booth was particularly impressed by this 19th century painting on a folded screen. The bold composition. A bridge seeming to continue beyond the borders of the painting. Contrast with the delicate brushwork. He found it stunning. In 2002, Booth came to study in Japan under a scholarship sponsored by the Japanese government. He enrolled at Tokyo University of the Arts and began studying Nihonga painting in earnest. At around this time, Booth encountered a painting that would influence his own style. White Elephant on a Cedar Door. A 17th century work by Tawaraya Sotatsu. Elephants are held sacred in Buddhism. But when this painting was made, there were no actual elephants in Japan. Booth was moved by how the painter had worked from his imagination. Inspired, Booth let his own imagination run free and began to use various kinds of elephant motifs in his paintings. This is an elephant version of the Greek god Prometheus, who brought fire to human beings. Here's his take on a rabbit that appears in Japan's oldest extant chronicle, the Kojiki. Using fables and allegories is part of Booth's unique style. In 2008, Booth completed his doctorate at Tokyo University of the Arts. Since then, he has continued to create many original works and hold annual solo exhibitions.
What do you think it is that fascinates you so much about elephants? In uh, Japanese history of art, there are quite a lot of paintings of elephants. The white elephant is particularly important. And uh, it's interesting if you look back how the, the way the artist imagined the elephant, because we don't know if all the artists actually saw real elephants. They had to imagine them, and uh, that gave them a lot of room to play. And so sometimes they have lots of tusks, or you know, like six pairs of tusks, or sometimes they have longer trunks or scary eyes. Mm. And uh, so it's a very, it was fascinating for me to see how they imagined and interpreted the, the idea of this beast that uh, they may or may not have actually seen. Uh -huh. And another thing about this elephant, the, the outline is very clearly delineated, which again, I guess is another thing that they often do in yes, Japanese style paintings. Yes, mainly in Japanese painting, you start with a, a faint underdrawing, or a line drawing, mm. and uh, line's very important, and uh, I, I really like the beauty of line. I think it comes from uh, calligraphy. Mm. But you also, if you think about uh, manga comics, you know, they're, they're right. uh, very... Uh, popular in Japan, right. and uh, it's, uh, again, it's the sense of the line there. Um, well, what you said about humour made me think of comics. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, there's so much you can express just in line alone, and uh, that's what manga is all about. Mm. And uh, so that's kind of interesting, you've got this uh, continuation of tradition um, from Japanese painting into uh, contemporary culture of uh, manga comics. Mm. And uh, again, with well, thinking about this uh, freedom of the Japanese to imagine or play. This is kind of play mm -hmm. around. I mean, a lot of manga also has this, uh, it's a mixture of uh, reality and fiction. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. perhaps, I don't know, but maybe it comes ab about through the Japanese language. With the Japanese, they, they don't use uh, personal pronouns. Uh, or, I mean, they have them, but they don't often use them. That's right, you wonder why they have them sometimes, <laughs> because they're so f infrequently used, yeah. You know, you, we say, I go, mm. you just say, go. Right, right. <laughs> now, when I first came to Japan, I get, I'd get uh, a mail to my mobile phone, and I'd, it would uh, say, going. <laughs> and I was uh, like, who's okay. going, where are they going, uh, okay. <laughs> what, when? I need some more information. So all of this yeah. confusion leads to having a more fertile imagination? Well, I think so, because it's, oh. it's an ambigu ambiguous uh -huh. kind of e element to their spoken language, which I think may uh. also um, come about in other parts of the culture with music and art, in that it leaves a kind of room for you to play or change, interpret things from your own position. Mm. So. It's kind of interesting that it comes, perhaps anyway, from uh, language and then through into art and uh, the Japanese ability to kind of play and create. So uh, that's very fascinating. Yeah. Mm. Nihonga painting uses special materials and methods. Perhaps its quintessential feature is the use of unprocessed natural pigments. One of the most important pigments is a white one made by grinding oyster shells into a fine powder. This pigment will not adhere to surfaces on its own, so it's mixed with gelatinous natural glue made from the hides and bones of animals. Working with this white pigment is quite labor intensive. As the powder is so finely ground, it's hard to mix in the glue. Times. Here, Booth is tossing the pigment against the dish to ensure that the powder is well coated with glue. He needs to toss the pigment like this 100 times. Once the pigment is thoroughly coated in glue, Booth dissolves it in water. A bit of time it this thins the pigment so that it can be applied with a brush. It's still thick. You can't tell how a colour will turn out immediately after applying it. A painting must sit overnight while the water in the pigment evaporates. And then a pigment must be reapplied several times over the course of about a week.
to achieve the exact color the painter wants. Using the special pigments of Nihonga painting requires great care and patience. I was going to say, it takes a lot of patience, I can see, yeah. <laughs> it certainly does. <laughs> yeah. Do any other of the colours present similar problems? I've uh, got a few samples here. This is a uh, rock shore, which is a traditional colour. It's made from malachite, so it's all the same mineral pigment. Mm. And the more you grind it down, the finer it becomes, you get this uh, lighter colour. This is in between. Yeah. And uh, this is a much coarser pigment. That's not mixed with another colour? No, nope, they're all exactly the same mineral. So you, you've got the, uh, the same mineral pigment, but uh, depending on the fineness of the, the grain or how much it's ground down, you get uh, quite a, a darker colour or a lighter colour, all the mm. different tones. And uh, it took me ages at first to get used to just having a sense about how much I needed to add of the glue in order mm. to get it to stay, stay on the... the um, on the surface ah, I see. and uh, it depends on the weather sometimes with the humidity you need to uh, reduce the amount and so in the summer it dries very quickly so it, it uh, depends on not not just the weather but also the surface you're painting on I painted a picture and my my teacher or my sensei it's, um, he came along and uh, he put his finger and he went and took the color off <laughs> and oh my god like, and you uh, thought it had already completely dried so yeah well, it, no, it had dried, but because oh. I didn't put enough of the glue in, oh. he took the colour off, he says you, it's too weak, it, it will fall uh, off, basically. Oh, I so see. So in time, if you don't use enough glue, in time, the uh, pigment will fall off, and you don't want that. So uh, okay. you have to get to know that just the right amount that uh, makes the, keeps the mineral pigments stuck to the surface. What um, made you persevere then? I don't know, it's my personality, I guess. I thought, I'm not going to give up, I'm going to do this. Uh, uh, <laughs> so if the Japanese can do it, I can do it. <laughs> Was there anything in the materials themselves that you found so attractive, I suppose, is the word? I think that's it, as uh, the, the, the materials are, are very beautiful mm. and uh, the, the pigment flows from the brush and, and forms on the paper. So y y there is a, a nice kind of natural randomness that mm. happens and mm. I really like that it's it's uh, it adds an extra layer of beauty and surprise into the into the work mm. since 2007 Booth and his wife Miki have lived in Asakusa a district in Tokyo that retains the atmosphere of the old days in Asakusa there are many festivals with a history going back centuries almost invariably portable shrines Shrines are at the heart of these festivals. Local residents hoist them on their shoulders and carry them through the streets. Booth loves this tradition. For the past five years, he has helped to carry the shrine in his own neighborhood festival. Festivals also typically include a fair. Colorful stalls line the streets. Delicious smells waft from food stalls. I want grilled fish. Fish? Booth is holding a skewer of salt grilled river fish. It's good, good. It's great. It's a bit hot though. I can't quite eat it yet. <laughs> covered in salt, white fish. I love it. Booth is about to visit a place in old Tokyo that he has been coming to since he moved to Japan. This art supply shop has been in business for a century. <laughs> the shopkeeper now is Yukiko Miyochi, and Booth has been coming here since her father ran the place. This shop carries an extensive range of high quality mineral and shell based pigments. Booth says he can always find just the colour he needs here. Look at this lovely ultramarine. I've been wanting to show you this. This is top quality. It was made from the best minerals. So the hue is really vibrant. Booth says that when he first arrived in Japan, Miyochi taught him the practical know-how of Nihonga painting. 
She understands his work. He's such a friendly guy. He never brought along someone to interpret for him. He was determined to communicate on his own. And I enjoyed talking to him. Was he fitting in okay? I think so, but I don't really know. Even if things were tough for him, he never showed it. Anyway, he seemed to be having fun, and I always enjoyed seeing him too. In Tokyo's old town, Booth found traditional Japanese culture and friendly people. Both have become powerful sources of inspiration for him. As an artist, I uh, enjoy kind of the experience of living in the old town. Mm. Uh, you can still see people uh, making rice cakes or painting lanterns. Uh, so you can, you can experience the Edo culture, the culture that um, has its roots in Asakusa. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting that you get in Tokyo a bit of a mix. So you get some new buildings, but you get uh, you can feel the life of the people uh, uh, when they're living in that area. Mm. So it's, it's a fun place to live. And uh, you, also you were taking part in the festival, uh, uh, carrying the Mikoshi, the, the portable shrine is what they call it. Not very portable, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a, a t a one or two tons or something like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's quite an experience. I, uh, I mean, Looking at the photograph, I was saying, this man is in pain. <laughs> and the well, reason I said that is because I've experienced it myself when I was in pain. Uh, you, have I know. <laughs> <laughs> you have to carry it on your shoulder. And I learned after a while that uh, you have to work together. Um, yep, originally, I was secret. thinking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry this. <laughs> and, uh, well, I'm not tall, but I was slightly taller, so I'm trying to carry this um, portable shrine. But it's uh, just too much, and it... Uh, if you do it that way, basically, it does hurt. But then you realize that uh, it, if, if everybody moves together and uh, everybody, all the, the community, you get the spirit mm -hmm. and, and everybody moves together, you can, it's, it's like a dance, really. And uh, then it's quite an amazing experience. Um, you work as one group. So, yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I really like that. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't feel that they get that much in uh, the UK. I think it's an important part of that um, old town kind of community spirit mm. and uh, it helps people get to know each other and uh, mm. let, let their hair down. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. So it's, uh, it's really great. Mm. Do you think that that lifestyle that you have in Asakusa has influenced the way that you approach your work? Yes, I think uh, if you think about Europe, uh, the uh, artists tend to be loners really. Mm. They, uh, they go in their studio and nobody sees them for days and they create a masterpiece. But um, in Japan, there's much more of a communal, communal spirit. And mm. uh, so you have artists that work in uh, groups or schools, if you'd like to call it that way. They work together to produce something. So uh, mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting kind of uh, perspective or a different mentality to think about their work. In Europe, you often see paintings in these huge frames, mm -hmm. um, and it sort of singles out the work. But uh, in uh, Japanese art, they use it in homes, it's in, it's in the doors, it's actually in the space that everybody uses. Uh -huh. So it's uh, kind of a more open and um, more kind of communal thing. So I think it's kind of interesting, slightly different take on things. Mm. Adam Booth has made a name for himself as a Nihonga painter. Recently, he undertook a new kind of challenge. Creating digital art that uses elements of Nihonga. Since 2008, Booth has been working with a group of creative people called Team Lab, made up of everyone from architects to calligraphers. Two years ago, they were asked to undertake an ambitious project. creating a piece of digital art that will be put on display at Tokyo Skytree. Completed in May 2012, Skytree is the world's tallest communications tower. Even two years ago, everyone knew it would be the city's new landmark. As Booth worked on this digital artwork, he was thinking about a Nihonga masterpiece. 
This large painting created in the 16th century depicts the city of Kilta. It shows both buildings and the people who live in them. Booth wanted to create a tribute to this work, one that showcased modern day Tokyo. He spent two years photographing buildings all around Tokyo. He used these photos to make sketches, which he scanned into a computer and colored digitally. Who then combined these illustrations into one giant work. Here is the completed Tokyo Sky Tree Mural. It's three meters high and 40 meters wide, and a section of it is animated, showing even more clearly the hustle and bustle of Tokyo life. Here's Tokyo's infamous rush hour. And here's a festival in Asakusa including the kind of portable shrine that Booth helps to carry through his neighborhood each year. A giant mural that embodies Booth's love of Tokyo. He makes use of Nihonga traditions to make art that is unique and stimulating. We've got one piece of the detail from one of the animated parts here, one panel here. And you have the Sumida River, which of course flows through the old part of town. Um, and it's like the, the, the central part of the, the whole thing, I guess. Yeah, I wanted to uh, create an image like a, a ukiyo-e hanga, very traditional, like prints yep. from uh, the Edo period. And uh, they uh, often were based around um, Sumidagawa. I wanted to create an, a modern version. They used to make their prints with uh, layers, basically, yep. and uh, to create very beautiful graduations. Mm. So I uh, painted this actually on a computer, but it's uh, layered with darker colors. So there's a really strong blue in the middle, mm -hmm. and then faded it out mm. towards um, a green, slightly more green color. Mm. So I wanted to get the deepness of that Japanese eye, of that, that Japanese blue. Mm. And uh, there's about eight layers in this river, all gradually um, fading into each other. Wow. You've got an incredible amount of, I mean, detail, of course. And it it's, it's really seems very realistic, um, a lot of it. And then suddenly you'll have these kind of giant sushi or a, uh, a small wrestler down in the corner there. Things like that, which kind of really play with the reality suddenly. Yeah. You know, Tokyo is a mix mash of um, all sorts of different buildings and it's crazy, it's chaos. Yeah, and uh, I just, true. I, I wanted to kind of express that and uh, I wanted to put um, parts of Japanese culture as well in, mm. into the work. And You've got the uh, drunks here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, everybody knows that you have um, kaiten sushi, where the sushi goes round on plates. Yeah. I know, it's, it's great fun, you know, to sit there and have the sushi going round. Well, it's a bit of a play on that, and uh, I decided to have the people, or the drunks, going round the, <laughs> round the sushi. <laughs> so, uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of crazy, but it's, it's fun. I mean, with a the picture, there's no boundaries to what you can do. Yeah, we have the ebi or the prawn sushi. Yeah. And uh, oh, his eyebrows are moving, the, the sumo. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> so uh, it's not just about expressing the, the, the city as a drawing, it's about the city and all the people in it. Mm. And uh, that's what uh, makes Tokyo such an exciting place. It's this mixture, and you've got uh, the fantasy worlds, the comic manga worlds, you've got the. Everything's mixed up, and, and I think that's what makes t Tokyo so exciting. Mm. Well, uh, last question, always the same question with these Japanophile programs. What is Japan to you? I think it's a Japanese uh, word or a short expression, um, and it's fude no inochi, which means life of the brush. Uh -huh. And uh, I've brought a, a brush along with me. 
This is a, a Japanese brush that I use for my painting. Right. And uh, the very, the nib, the, the end of the brush, this is the, the life. Mm -hmm. the life of the brush. Mm -hmm. What I was thinking about is the Japanese have supported me and they've been so kind and they have given me the life of my painting and my brush. So with that tip on its own it means nothing but the support, the whole brush in itself joins together to give me the life to, for my painting. So that's the kind of support that the Japanese people have given to me. Okay, very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you.